My background is that I work for Hennepin County in the HR department. I am uh, a compensation analyst, and so most of the work uh, in the sort of the HR vein and, and some, of the, some of the analytics that we did came from me. My name is Mike David, also an MPA student. That's how we met. MPA, it's, it's geared towards mid-career professionals. So my day job is as a Marine Corps Infantry Officer. And I'm stationed at the University of Minnesota in the Naval Service Department, Naval Science Department, where I trained the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps Officers. I was encouraged to attend Humber School after speaking with Professor Curtis, who talked about the mission statement of the school, which I immediately bought into, because they're just trying to improve just trying to improve, improve communities wherever possible. And then comes in two years later, two and a half years to be specific, and comes in Mr. Brown, who says, I'm with the RCP. We've been here for two and a half years, I have no idea who the RCP is. But he comes and talks to us about what their mission is. So I like this. This is going to be an interesting capstone. The capstone is our culminated event in order to graduate before we get out of here, which is good because I have to rotate out in seven, six months to somewhere warmer. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, however, the RCP mission, we love. And there's 25 different projects that were proposed that were partnered with Broken Park and the RCP. And immediately Dan and I, who didn't know each other from Adam, I said, I like the police one. I think that's a great call, and I think that's a great cause to put time and energy behind for the next 20 days. And Dan felt the same way. So, excuse me, but a weird analytics HR guy and, and an overly aggressive infantry marine second partner. <laughs> <laughs> and the results we don't really know, but we hope you guys are proud of it. <laughs> uh, this is our humble attempt. And we're going to go through about 32 slides today, and I've given out some of the books that Dan and I have created. It's 103 pages, multiple tendencies that we'll discuss, but I think you take your time and get a lot of the depth. So today we're going to give you the mile wide, inch deep, but with the book and the analysis that we did, you'll get the mile wide, mile deep version of what we're going to provide for you. So here are the best schools to recruit from, according to our data. Uh, Concordia in St. Paul was uh, by far the best because uh, he, the number isn't up here, but it also had a, a large number of individuals. It was a large program with a high percentage. Second best, Hennepin uh, Community Technical College. When you get into the paper, you'll see that they, that's a high percentage, but they had a relatively low number of students. So it's a, a, a less rich uh, a place to recruit from. Uh, law enforcement programs, 5.5% of a group of, uh, I don't have the number up on the board, but it's about 4,000 students that we counted total are in uh, our African American, excuse me. Now we, after that it's hard to tell what happens to them. We, we do know from post-board data that very close to 900 or so on average pass the post exam each year. 5.5% uh, of uh, 890 is I think the exact number, is equal to 43.5 African American candidates being produced by the state of Minnesota per year. That ignores the background check. Some of them are going to fall out because of the background check. Some of them are going to decide they'd like a different career. Some of them are going to get hired in loss prevention in the retail industry, and some of them are going to go into corrections or become parole officers, etc. So this number is probably low, but that is one tenth of one person per police department. So uh, what we found preliminarily using uh, the best data available is that yes, there is indeed a problem where Minnesota is not producing enough African-American candidates to properly diversify its police forces. Yet another uh, visualization uh, logic model. This is how, you know, in, in, in my head as I was making this, I, I, I called this the stuff we have control over all. Um, if you think of yourself as a leader of a, uh, a employer and an employment organization, a police force or whatever, and, and you're thinking, okay, what are the elements of, of, of my uh, diversity process that, that I can actually work on? Uh, there are five, and they interrelate as the arrows show. Uh, you have your strategic planning, which, of course, uh, even if you don't call it strategic planning, leaders are making decisions, okay? So you have strategic planning going on in your department, whether you're following the Humphrey School's, uh, you know, Dr. John Bryson methodology, or if you are just sitting around a table deciding what to do with, with your fellow leaders and, and analysts and such, you have strategic planning. And that impacts all the other areas of the process. Uh, you have your profile as employer, that is your, your reputation, 
We learned uh, very early on that uh, police officers in this area are in a close-knit network. They know what's going on in other departments. They, uh, uh, the reputation of the department can, can impact its recruitment, which you see is the next uh, area. Recruitment obviously leads to who applies, and that fills your applicant pool. And then after uh, they make it through the application process, they come into your department where they're subject to your HR practices which in turn impact your reputation as an employer. So throughout the rest of this uh, 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 presentation, that's the word for what we're doing. Throughout the rest of this presentation, we'll use, we'll, we'll refer back to this to, to discuss which part of this process that we're referencing. Okay, and I'm gonna do that starting with the strategic plan. Uh, as I mentioned before, everybody does strategic planning whether they know it or not. Uh, we recommend that strategic planning start with your mission, your vision, and your goals. Uh, these are sort of commonly known terms, I won't get into them too much. But, but you start with what your organization is all about and what its purpose is, and you work from that to come up with what your, your plans will be for, uh, for going forward and accomplishing your goals. It's almost uh, self-evident to say that. Um, what, we're, what we're saying here is, is that uh, we would like to see uh, diversity and inclusion as a theme, as a topic added to vision, mission, and goals so that when the organization goes back to its uh, planning process, those concepts are included in the planning process. Doing that has a secondary benefit of signaling to the community that you serve who does want to see your vision, mission, and goals. Uh, that, that, that shows to them that you're serious, that, that you have a commitment to diversity and Dang it, it's in our city mission statement, or it's in our police department mission statement. Um, and another element of strategic planning where diversity comes into play is that you should think through what your rationale is for diversity. Why you want to do something is really important because it, 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 it affects how you end up doing it. If you just have a goal, but no rationale for that goal, you might end up uh, trying to accomplish that goal in a way that works against your rationale. Now, the Harvard Business Review did a great job uh, uh, sort of figuring out what, what the major employer paradigms were for, as to a rationale for diversity. Um, those three paradigms are up here on the screen, and I'd like to discuss them uh, uh, with you as sort of a good, better, best kind of, a, kind of an order. Um, probably the original diversity paradigm was called the discrimination and fairness paradigm by the Harvard Business Review. Uh, in that paradigm, uh, you're basically trying to redress a, a historical wrong. So you're saying, you know, gee whiz, uh, uh, we've been we've been bad. We're going to be good in the future, and so that means we got to hire, you know, X percent of people of this ethnicity because that will fix our past problems. Uh, you know, I I congratulate anyone who's made that ethical decision, but that's not uh, the best diversity paradigm, in my opinion. Secondly, you have the access and legitimacy paradigm. What comes to mind here is like maybe a sales force, if you had guys that were doing sales for you. Uh, police work uh, is, is also amiable to this particular paradigm. And under this paradigm, you say, gosh, you know, if we had a Mexican American person on our police force or on our sales force, that person could go and talk to the other people from his own delegation. And then, you know, that person would give to the organization access to that group of people, legitimacy with that group of people. He could talk to the witnesses, he could form alliances, and, and, and that would improve our department, you might say. The third paradigm uh, it was emerging at the time that the uh, Harvard Business Review uh, produced the article, and it's, 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 a, it's a good read, I'd recommend you check it out. Uh, I've renamed it the Embracing Diversity Paradigm in, in the Harvard Business Review Journal, and indeed in our paper, we call it the diverse work perspectives paradigm. But this is a much better rationale for why we want to diversify the police department. Under the embracing diversity paradigm, you say a homogenous workforce is worse than a heterogeneous workforce. If you get a group of people together and they have different background experiences, different reactions to adversities, different problem solving skills, different points of view, etc then those people network and map together better, producing a better organization 
than if everybody was from the same background. And what, what I like the most about this paradigm is it changes the definition of the best available candidate. Under the prior two uh, paradigms, the best available candidate is, is, is ignored and you go, you know, I gotta hire somebody from this other group. Under this paradigm, the best available candidate is, is, is who you want to hire. It's just that you're including the fact that this person can bring diversity to your department in the mental calculus behind that hire. So the, 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 we strongly recommend uh, sort of in, in communications with hiring managers, in deliberations with the community, in strategic planning processes of all kinds of branding, um, you take the third paradigm and embrace it and just really say, and, and, and indeed, with one of our first interviews with Brooklyn Park Police Department, we were told that the best reason for diversifying the Park Police Force was that it would make it better. I absolutely agree with that. I absolutely endorse it. That is, that is indeed where we are coming from, and um, uh, we, we hope that you embrace it as well. Ah, finally. <laughs> I listened to Dan talk for 90 days. He's probably said we're paradox about 100 times to me. So I'm glad that you got to appreciate some of that. The next two slides we're going to cover are the three bullet points here. We'll talk about branding a little bit, the profile of your employer. And that was unique and interesting as well. The focus group of the African American police officers, and it's in the text, were referred to the police officers in Minnesota as gossipy middle schoolers almost. And I can relate coming from a, an environment where there's a lot of individuals like minded, where news travels fast. So the 10,500 individuals with the police force, information flows. So branding yourself in a particular manner is going to travel and it's going to reach adjacent units as far as other departments exist. We'll talk a about that. And then salary rates. And then officers, we'll talk about the potential as, as the five top goods, if you want to, and five bads, or successes and improvements. First, we'll start with successes and improvements. So from the survey, the internal and honest survey of the 104 individuals in the Brooklyn Park Police Department, 97 fill out survey, these are the top five we found with recruitment and retention that were highest in percentage agreed. So focusing on, I do my part to make sure new police officers are welcome. 95% well, of the department believe, yeah, I do my part to make sure that happens. My department's policy procedures discourage community discrimination. Again, percentage of agree. I believe my department will take appropriate action in response to instances of discrimination. Again, a high level of agreement. And then my department's policy is now focusing internally, internal to our discrimination. It feels like it'll be handled with appropriately. And then lastly, the individuals with different backgrounds interact well with the department. Another high level of agreement. So we concluded that we believe that we're, the police officers of Brooklyn Park believe that workplace is largely a positive one and takes the appropriate protection protections in place to ensure discrimination is not occurring. Now, with the strikes, there is almost improvement. This is focused more on command climate and cultural awareness, or that's what we identified as what was lacking, at least by the percentage of agreeable. The first one was increasing police education by diversity will enhance the department's proficiency. 41% they said so they agree. So, therefore, cultural competencies or additional training, which is nested into one of the 14 recommendations more in depth, how that might improve your police officers' understanding of the community they serve. They serve. The next is, I believe, increased community involvement from Brooklyn Park PD with helps for the community. And about 45% approval on that, or agreeable on that. I believe the more African American police officers strengthen the department, about 30% agree. I believe African American citizens of Brooklyn Park have a positive opinion of the police department itself. Again, you're still hovering around that 40 50 mark. And then lastly, was I be more satisfied with my work if the department became more diverse? 12% agree with us. So we identified the areas where officer agreement were the lowest related to skepticism of diversity related ideas and interventions. Honing in on the last one, and Dan talked about it a little uh, earlier about strategic objectives. Brooklyn Park City itself, and I could be wrong, but I doubt it, is lacking a vision statement. And the mission statement fails to even address the word diversity again. So there you have a police department who falls subordinate to a city government. And within the police department, they're going to come up and they have a wonderful mission statement and a good vision statement and principles and values of the police officers that they want to see. However, how can they nest with, and this is in the recommendations, much more in depth, how can a police department nest the priorities of diversity if the city government doesn't have a vision statement and also fails to say the word diversity in their mission statement? So that's just one little concern because now when you have newly sworn in Officer Javier that checks in, I'm going to buy in a little bit more, at least in my opinion, to diversify my police force because I see that my government is telling me to do that. Because it seems like it's part of the mission. 
just maybe a, one of the recommendations is realign that mission and vision statement to, that, to marry up or nest with that incumbent. So next, employer branding. Dan talked a little bit about this. We, we put this corny picture up on purpose because if this was actually a company that was hiring, it tells us a couple of things. It tells us one gender is accepted on either, either side. It tells us that, well, yeah, it looks like they're a little bit ethnically diverse. As simple as that, that picture sends signals and sends messages. And you talked about the urban radio station, and that was brought up in one of our focus groups, is, hey, if you're interested in us, why aren't you advertising on our outlets? Damn, why aren't you advertising our outlets? Why aren't you going and looking at Black Perspective magazine and using the online magazine and just, you know, it's very minimal and fun. It's all these, all these recommendations, and that's, we only put the recommendations in the 14 that we gave when it reached the mixed methods methodology and it was also reinforced in literature and it was also reinforced in other means. So the speculative discussion was brought up and said, hey, you gotta advertise to us if you want. It shows that you care, okay? Profile of an employer. This one, uh, she really was spot on. We sat with him back in September and he said, I don't think you're gonna see anything that says, as far as money, that we are lagging pay. And he was absolutely right. This shows that within the metro area cities, so we took what we found was municipalities similar in size, and we looked at their pay charts, Egan, Lewiston, Plymouth, et cetera, and we showed the broken part base. So looking at years to max rate, actually broken broken part is doing better than others. In 14 years, you can reach max salary. Min salary is competitive, midpoint salary is competitive, max salary is competitive. So money shouldn't be a dissatisfier, or at least as far as a hiring mechanism at this point. Now on the state level, what we found, similar. Department of Labor 2015 salary stats are up there in the 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentiles. Compounding the ideology that if you're 14 years you can reach max pay, and max pay for Broken Park Patrol Officer is going to be 82,000, which puts them in the top 10% of the state, as well as they can achieve that goal quicker than other departments. Makes it pretty encouraging to work for Broken Park. So that's a good sales pitch, at least for recruiting considering. If again, money is one of that recruiters or one of that individual's top priorities for choosing a place of employment. Uh, so salary rates are competitive and they're hanging out there you know, on the NeoGov portal that everybody is well familiar with, I'm sure. And uh, you uh, you have that minimal level of recruitment. There is uh, a posting on the internet. That counts as recruitment, but we'd like to see uh, you know more done. And of course, some of this is already being done. Um, first of all, uh, we'd like to recommend in this section that uh, using the school survey that we came up with, that recruitment is conducted from the most diverse schools. And I will list in a later slide top four that we found. Uh, secondly, uh, the cadet program uh, is, is really a very important tool. Uh, it, it aligned really well with uh, areas where we thought Brooklyn Park needed the most improvement. There was the cadet program right there sort of provide that improvement in that same area. So I'll go on and talk about the cadet program a little bit later. Um, and secondly, in recruitment, what we found in every key informant interview and in both focus groups, the idea that if money was spent, if effort was spent, if in some way recruitment directed at the African American community amounted to an act of seriousness, proof of interest, that that was a very powerful thing. You know, put your money where your mouth is, is a direct quote from one of our key informant interviews. Um, and uh, the, we, we found that in uh, naive 18 year old college students, and we found that in, uh, uh, you know, 20 year veterans. So uh, it was, it was a, a pretty profound idea. And, and so uh, symbolic actions, uh, sending a recruiter to come and talk to the Black Police Officers Association sending a recruiter to a diverse uh, place, uh, advertising on KMOJ. It, it's interpreted as an act by some of the folks, by some of the folks that we spoke with at least, as a, a, an act of seriousness. Oh, they really do want to hire me, so-and-so might say. So this is the applicant pool that we've averaged over the last three hires conducted by Brooklyn Park. Um, and shows the uh, demographic breakdown of all those applicants. This is everybody who met minimum qualifications. So these are all people who've been through the post board pipeline that we described earlier. 6% of that group is African American. Uh, 
And uh, of that 6%, that would be, that actually, they've been getting around 100 applicants meeting minimum qualifications in each application. So you could think of that as six individuals uh, hired that were, that, were, that were there to be hired, uh, but didn't make it all the way through the process um, because they were surrounded by 100 other people from other ethnicities um, who, who, in the end, uh, according to the NeoGo data, uh, ended up getting jobs. Um, but that's that, that's actually a, a nice confirmation. We were saying that 5.5 percent of uh, the students in uh, in the pipeline schools are African American. Well, six percent are applying here, so that makes us feel a little bit better about the veracity of our school uh, survey. Here are the best schools to recruit from, according to our data. Uh, Concordia in St. Paul was uh, by far the best because uh, he, the number isn't up here, but it also had a, a large number of individuals. It was a large program with a high percentage. Second best, Hennepin uh, Community and Technical College. When you get into the paper, you'll see that they, that's a high percentage, but they had a relatively low number of students. So that's a, a, a less rich uh, a place to recruit from than the percentage might imply. And then uh, Hennepin Tech, of course, uh, made the list, as did uh, Hamline University. Uh, not sure what it is with schools in St. Paul, but they did tend to perform better than schools in the site. The cadet program. Let's talk about the cadet program for a second. Uh, we, we mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the, 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 the applicant pool, if you just post uh, uh, an online application, is pretty thin. We mentioned that the pipeline is producing very, very low number of African-American candidates per year. But with the cadet program, you have the opportunity to, to reach people as they are emerging out of high school or as they are a young adult in the community college and get them through, shepherd them through a PPOE program in such a way that at the end of that process, they have a distinct advantage over the other applicants in your applicant pool because they have experience that is specific to your organization. So uh, the candidate, the, uh, the cadet program has the potential for not only um, uh, helping with the recruitment, but then uh, taking that recruited person and ensuring that they make it through the application process. So that's two circles on, on, the, on the conceptual model we had up a little bit earlier. Um, and then uh, the, 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 the common understanding is, is that uh, Minority groups, uh, people of color, tend to have uh, tend to be emerging from uh, situations where they have a higher degree of economic necessity when they are young. So having a cadet program where you get a part-time job and you're more certain to later have employment following the end of that part-time job is really a key selling point. Uh, if you're coming from a situation where you are of little means and you don't have a lot of money, uh, you need to get through a college program of some sort. So. The CADET program is really well aligned to the uh, recruitment and application parts of this issue. Uh, you? Yeah. All right. Okay, so we'll cover the next whole process of the application process, which, uh, which we understand is currently and always is being revamped and modified better to be more a better product. Yeah. So we'll go through uh, kind of barrier analysis and short process as matter of things. What we attempted to do here was who in Minnesota, what department is being successful with this? But the thing is, you know, we, we talk at length with uh, Professor Lindsay, it's got to be best practices, right? But it's only according to the variables in which that department exists. So no one has the exact same mission and vision and principles that Brooklyn Park does. But what we found is Metro Transit Police Department, again, a different mission and vision, has very similar characteristics as far as police officers who are trying to provide security and support for the local residents. Different area of operation. I understand transit is different than Brooklyn Park. However, what we discovered was, in the conversation with them, was something called a barrier, a barrier analysis. In addition to that, it wasn't used in the same terms, but the concept was there and existed within the focus groups and other interviews. A barrier analysis was used to identify disproportionately numbers of any type of demographic. So for example, this one is African Americans that are being eliminated in our hiring process. And then you, then you look from the eliminating group to exactly, hey, how does that performance that we're eliminating on tie to the performance of proficiency and tasks that they're going to perform as police officers? 
And those don't vary out. You either modify the task or you remove the barrier. So and that's exactly what we heard from Chief Harrington throughout a long discussion about it. And it's in the book, his specific recommendations or ideas of what he did to take a department when he joined four years ago as the fourth African American to now have 22 African Americans four years later. How did you do it? And he tells us the story of the barrier analysis. He doesn't use that specific term, and that's exactly what he's saying. He says, I looked at the application process differently. Would that necessarily work for a part? No, but I think a barrier analysis within their own vision and mission statement, within their own principles, is an effective, it's an effective method. So we talk about that. And then if the practice is deemed, again, the analysis is done, disproportionate numbers fall out. We confirm or deny that that, that skill set isn't exactly what we want out of the proficiency of a police officer. Well, then we modify our this is the current application process for building department. Again, we understand it could be in flex, but this is what it was as of June 30th. 20 weeks is what it's been reduced to at the time. As Dan has pointed out, you have young men and women that want a job. You owe money from school, you went to skills, you went to search training, you're trained, you're qualified. How do I get a job? This is the process where we look at the tail of two cities. Well, what are Metro Transit? Do they almost have an inverse relationship to how they address this? Whether it works for Metro uh, Program Park or not, it's a Program Park to determine. But this process, I think we can all universally agree, is to be reduced because 20 weeks is a length of time. But how do you reduce it? That's up to the chiefs to decide. What we recommend is reduce those barriers that force attrition by welcome diversity. So, for example, hypothetically, you're talking about this one, 28 days, we're job posts on the line. Is that where you want to reduce? I and mean, we could argue that the longer an online application is available, the more candidates you get. Maybe where you reduce is a 49 day background interview. Well, how do you reduce, reduce a background? That's up to the chief. Out, but we have recommendations in favor of processes that can be applied. But either way, you have 20 weeks. 20 weeks from a job posting to being offered a probationary hiring, which is a very difficult gauntlet for a young man who wants to go a significant amount of money coming out of school. Over at HR practices. Okay. So, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, we did conduct a survey uh, that. Uh, Mike mentioned the one half of the survey, that was the uh, diversity attitudes half. Um, the other half of the survey uh, just, just had to do with uh, job satisfaction and job satisfaction factors that relate to turnover. We wanted to explore the subject as of, of, of whether or not Brooklyn Park Police Department is a, is, a, is, a, is a type of employer that can really retain employees of all colors. Is it, is it a, an attractive employer for, for a cop in this area? What we found is that largely it is. Um, let's see if I'm missing anything. Yeah, uh, uh, turnover was low, and uh, uh, when we get to the negative parts of the uh, survey, we'll be discussing uh, sort of a main theme that emerged, which is that the officers at Brooklyn Park would like increased opportunities to communicate up the chain of command. So here you see uh, the top five most agreeable survey questions. Uh, you know, they understand and complete all of their job duties. They're committed to being a law enforcement officer. Uh, skipping one, they're committed to being, uh, to, committed to Brooklyn Park Police Department as an organization. So those are sort of twin questions that, that they both uh, answer very positively to. Uh, they clearly understand their role within the unit and uh, they have respect for their direct supervisor. They think that their direct supervisor does a good job. Um, these are all correlated with turnover here in the men's score column, and I want to—I want to know the latest winner does not work out. Um, I want to talk about that column for a second. This was taken from what's called a meta-analysis, and meta-analysis is when a researcher cobbles together the research that's been done by a lot of other researchers. So, uh, what we came across was uh, a, a, a uh, academic paper that summarized years and years of research uh, in the industrial psychology field that, uh, that uh, w where they took factors related, relating to employee satisfaction and correlated those factors with the degree to which that they uh, impact turnover. So if it says, for instance, that, that uh, negative 14% there in the top one, that meant that employees uh, who had a positive uh, appreciation of their job scope, i.e. they understood what their job was and could do it, uh, were 14% less likely to turn over in the aggregated studies uh, examined by the researcher. I know, I'm going into all of that because I don't want anyone to walk out of here thinking 
that because there was a uh, positive uh, view of job scope, that uh, turnover will go down by 14%. Use those percentages to gauge the relative importance of each of these factors as compared to each other, not to determine what your turnover will be. Um, nonetheless, they're very useful, and we use it as the basis for the survey. So when you do get the survey results, what you'll see is beside every answer, uh, you know, certain percentage agreed, certain percentage disagreed, and then there'll be a third number which will let you know what the relative importance of this is uh, as it relates to preventing employee turnover. Getting now to the bottom five uh, in this area, um, we see two, uh, two low scores which, which I think uh, are probably structural in nature. Uh, opportunities for promotion. If you guys don't have enough middle management positions for your underlings, don't change that, okay? I mean, the world does not need more middle management positions. Uh, if uh, the, the, the implication that I got out of that, in other words, was that uh, it's probably just a matter of math that there are not enough promotional opportunities. However, if there are additional pro promotional opportunities, you should probably know that your officers uh, don't believe necessarily, many of them don't believe that uh, they're well aligned to to, to be promoted. Um, the other one is, is relates to role conflict. Uh, as, as we all presume, I'm sure, uh, it's pretty difficult to be a police officer as well as a coach or a police officer. Uh, the, the police officer job and the role in life that you accept when you're a police officer it can impact other areas of your life. And they did confirm that assumption in the survey. The other three uh, uh, low scores were all tied to the same basic theme. Um, the department leadership and I exchange information about the work we do. They didn't think that was necessarily true. We have good communication where I work. They didn't agree with that. And uh, I have a say in most important decisions that affect me. So what we found here is uh, that, 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 and if you looked at the other uh, questions, the, the other 16 or so questions that we have put up on the screen for you here, You'll see that the scores overall for Oakland Park Police Department were very positive, and that uh, the, the, the workers there, uh, it would seem, have a very high regard for, for working there, and, and they like working in Oakland Park Police Department. But one area that is not structural that could be improved would just be allowing more opportunities for bottom-up uh, communication, uh, mentorship, that kind of thing. And, and we think that if you lower turnover in general, that's going to help you retain the African American. Ah, turnover itself. So we had this survey, and we conducted this survey, and it said the turnover should be low. Then we measured your turnover, and it was low. So that's good. That, that helps us with our mixed message approach, where, where we're trying to find confirmation from multiple sources. The overall turnover uh, averaged over the five-year period that I requested data, special thanks to the HR department here at Griffin Park, uh, was 5.7% turnover. Comparison? Public sector turnover generalized uh, over the same period in the state of Minnesota, oh, I'm sorry, that's a US uh, national average, is uh, 16%. So that's one third of public sector turnover. It's very good. Uh, we did, uh, in, in the paper, we made a comparison with uh, a specific to the law enforcement profession here in Minnesota using the Department of Labor Statistics. And uh, the turnover at Brooklyn Park was roughly the same as the turnover throughout the state. So you checked out there as well. And this is something that, that I really paused over. I'll just put the pointer here. Uh, the combined average African American turnover was lower than for Caucasians and lower than the overall average. Um, one thing that occurred immediately before we started the project is that of the four African Americans working at Brooklyn Park, one left to accept another uh, position elsewhere. And that was 25% turnover in that year, right? You know, and that's a really high, really ugly turnover number, but of course we, we all realize that that's caused by a small sample size. The way you overcome small sample size is you average it out over prior years. And what we did when we found that was that actually Brooklyn Park seems to be a place where an African American officer can stay. Um, retention, in other words, is less of a problem than recruitment and the application process. So that leaves us with priorities here. We'll go back to the conceptual model. 
And using the data that, that, we, that we went through and, and uh, the mixed method approach, we'd like to encourage you to set the following priorities. Recruitment, number one. Uh, only 6% of your applicant pool is African American. Um, if you're going for 24%, you're way behind. So uh, that's uh, priority number one. Of course, recruitment wouldn't really amount to much if you didn't actually hire them. So we would encourage you to use barrier analysis and the process of uh, continuous improvement on the application system, which is uh, already underway, I should mention, uh, to ensure that the recruitment efforts lead to hires. And the reason I've circled those two is because, as I mentioned before, those are the two areas where the cadet program touches. The cadets uh, get recruited uh, with a really sweet offer of a, of, of a job that can help you work through college. And then, once they hit that application process, you already know them. They've been working for you. So there's a, there's a really excellent uh, alignment there. And then finally, three, the third priority ought to be uh, a profile as an employer, as we discussed, uh, that relates directly to uh, your recruitment efforts. And then fourth, HR practices. Your HR practices check out the well. Turnover is low. Uh, employee satisfaction is high. Uh, rates of pay were competitive. And uh, based off of that, we, we, we thought, uh, you know, it's always important to keep a close eye on your HR practices to do the diversity and inclusion training, make sure that people are getting along. The HR environment inside the Park Police Department is actually pretty good. Um, especially, you know, if, if I include my own personal experiences working at Henry Cat, which of course I wouldn't do, um, uh, I'd say you guys are doing just fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and this brings us to our questions, comments, concerns page. Uh, this is just an overview of all 14 recommendations that appear in the paper. Uh, so you guys can, can read that. And Mike and I are available to answer any questions. Question and, and a little bit of statement too. So for for the group, um, we've already planned on the next steps, which this fit nicely into um, another RCT project, which is a psychology class that's going to take this work where we're at right now and go down some of the rabbit holes that they opened up. Um, I'll just give you one. Is one of them is like the, the background process um, and when we exclude people. Uh, MTC, I'll just give you an example. For MTC has really some really good success. They had four black police officers. Five years later, they had 22. Their model is predicated on, and this is by Chief Harrington's own design, his own admission, is he prides himself in selecting African Americans that have failed backgrounds from other agencies, and he hires them. So he, they failed Bloomington, he'll go hire that candidate because he'll, I don't mean this in a negative way, he looks the other way or looks around the issues that Bloomington had with them. Um, that's a contentious model, but we do believe there's work that a psychology class can do down in that arena about really peeling back the onion of the background process, if you will. I say that to lead into this is my question. So, <laughs> so when you talk about, I mean, the numbers are just incredibly low, and you focused heavily on recruitment, and then you also identified, which was really a surprise to me, the colleges that have the highest number of law enforcement African American students going through it. I, yeah. I'll be honest, that um, the first three are, are surprising to me. But if that's where we focus on our recruitment and the numbers are so low, we're, there's obviously a rub here of what can we recruit? If we're all split one tenth of a you know of a, a, a black officer in the whole state, yeah. how can there be any well, what's recruitment look like? Because even some of those yeah. must be getting lost in the Absolutely. corrections arena. Let's uh a uh, couple of observations that might answer that. One, uh, we did see some evidence as we went through this. It, it wasn't quite at a level where we wanted to publish it into the paper. We did see some evidence that the correction programs are more diverse. And so there is a recruitment opportunity there because here you've got a guy, he wants to wear a uniform. He want, he's comfortable being involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, he's, he's comfortable in the face of danger taking on potentially situations and circumstances, but um, uh, perhaps, and I'm just projecting a potential thought here, that person um, might be thinking, well, they, they wouldn't hire me anyways because I'm black, so I'll go into corrections. That's a safer profession. I know they'll hire me in corrections. There are already lots of black correctional officers. That was kind of an attitude that we picked up in, in some of the 
focus group discussions with the, with the college age kids. So yeah, I, I, I would go there and, and do that. But to get back to the larger point, um, you're in a challenging circumstance. Accept the challenge, fight like a dog, do some hires and out-compete uh, those jerks at Metro Transit. <laughs> that's, that's what I would yeah. say. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. prioritization still needs to go to the cadet program, which we're trying to discuss. And so if they come yeah. in the book, then we give them the paper we In the cadet program, you reach back to that place here where it's 8.4% or 9.0%. And we know locally, if you have a local focus at the local high school level, then that percentage goes up even further. And, and you, you don't, you're not selecting cadets based off of the racial criteria. You're, 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 you're selecting cadets because they're local. And then that feeds in a diverse population of people that you get to watch how they work for, what, two years? Um, so so that's just, it just, it strikes us as like a silver bullet, absolutely. The cadet program. The cadet program. I'm interested in when you were talking with the students, uh, the college students, they discussed any cultural barriers even on their end, overcoming inner family concerns about going into a profession that really historically has been trusted by African Americans. And what made them decide, I mean, what, what makes them decide to take a chance on, on a profession that really, like you said, historically has not always been represented yeah. well in their culture? Both, both, well, yeah, both focus groups spoke to that. I think the, the attraction uh, is, is, the, is, is pretty similar for, for all ethnicities. It's, it's a uniform job, it's public safety, you get, to, you, get to, you get to address wrongs in society and play an important role, protect people, and so forth. Uh, a lot of them spoke about wanting to be part of the solution, so to speak, and I think that's an additional motivation. Um, and uh, you know, the, you'll see in the, in the college student transcripts, uh, Many of them are quite open. You know, these that profession is against my people. I don't want to go into that profession because I would be acting against my own race. Some of them, some of them said that just quite openly. Um, but there were kids standing there right beside them who felt no shame in saying, "Well, I considered it. I thought it was a good idea." Right, roughly a third we found was almost the naysayers. No, I still want to pursue this profession. Yeah, and then the two thirds were rallying and saying, "Why would you want to do that?" But then when you move to the police officers who were African Americans or serving. Said, hey, my father told me as a quote, my father told me straight out, you don't join the military, you need to join the police. That's what black people don't do. And I put it in there and said, well, no, I said, yeah, it's hard. I was, I was second generation, I want to be second generation police officer. He says, my father still couldn't understand why I did it. So then that's why we say that that text is rich to pull some of those ideas of what's in the heart and soul of individual African American officers and a young African American kid that, that we really see on the streets here. Yeah. yeah. You know, obviously, Mike and I lack experience in, in that particular area of being uh, white people. But they didn't hold back thoughts because of it. There was no issues getting people to speak freely about the No, no, certainly not. We were welcome to, and that's one thing we should. We put it in an acknowledgement section, but we have a lot of appreciation of the things that we owe to a lot of different people. And the students that we talked to there at, at North Hampton Community College, the Police Officer Association, Rhonda specifically here, thank you. But a lot of people were more than willing to help facilitate this process, and it would have been possible to put our, our paper together. Yeah, yes. I think I know the answer to this question. You talked about the participate, participation from the schools, but do you have any sense how the historical trend for African American candidates to be the way that the analysis is the same? Or did not a, they will um, give you a year, I don't know. I wish the coach were to tell us that. Yeah, I could go back to the original data provided and look at that. For the most part, we asked for five years and then we averaged it. So uh, it buried somewhere in some Excel files that they have. There is that. I know all 29 schools. Yeah, exactly. We, we would only be able to generate a rough idea uh, as to whether it's improving or not. Um, so if there's a potential for that, but I think you need to do more research. Back to where the Did you guys think about it? Uh, how many of those 242 are, I guess I would say, available for recruitment? And how many are already in the schools under a program such as Cadet, um, through JCPP, or I know many of in St. Paul have similar programs. Yeah. How are they committed to other agencies? Right, no, it, that's a good point. Um, and, and I hope I impress upon everyone that the number is probably lower. I, I, we could have been wrong by, well, I guess, well, by estimating too many or too few. I, I would have to say that we erred on the side of too many. 
Um, and that's one of those factors that we couldn't really take into account. When you're making, uh, and you know, when you're soliciting data from a, from a, 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 a school, um, it's hard to, to get that kind of stuff from them because you're talking to an admin person who's sort of in their, their, their uh, data system and they don't really know. But that is the kind of thing that if the post board is calling the shots and dictating what information the schools need to report, the post board is in a position to say, you know, indicate whether this person is already involved in a, in a cadet program or something. And the appendix we provide highlights specifically the variables we have to calculate in order to get the numbers. So you can be on how to come up with this. You can track it and see where things fall. Sir? Yeah. Uh, and one reason I'm asking a question is that I reward someone for asking a question with one of those books, which I would kill for. So. <laughs> 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 but uh, my, my, professor Gerdes, he to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my question is, I think it was really valuable that you zeroed in on the importance of the brand of policing and the fact that that brand can be negative and be an impediment to uh, to recruitment. Yes. So my my question is, did any of your data suggest that a, a single because obviously the brand of policing is not created by a single department, it's created by what we see in the national news or right. in the state of Minnesota. But did your and, and you also suggested that your that within law enforcement the brands are pretty well understood. So people who maybe work in Brooklyn Park know what the brand is of St. Louis Park or whatever. Yeah. But uh, is, is it your sense that a single singular police department could really distinguish and differentiate its brand as being a positive brand amongst your pool amongst high school students? Is there an opportunity yeah. there? Yes, and thanks for teeing me up on that. I mean, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, the social network is such, uh, and uh, just uh, just the amount of attention that uh, local news agencies and so forth are, are pointing at this issue is such that there's a real opportunity here for the police department to step out and make diversity part of its brand. If you do that, then we would anticipate uh, you see that number in that applicant pool go up because there it's a very attractive uh, a profession to a lot of young people. For, for regular old non-ethnicity uh, related reasons. And uh, uh, if, if, if there was a, a higher degree of certitude that they're not racist, they want to hire me, that, that, I, that uh, the data suggested that that would be a pretty crackerjack uh, effect. Yeah. I'd be curious in your interview with the Black Police Officers Association and other officers in your interview, the dynamic we suffer in suburban agencies is and this was admitted to me by um, the President of Black Police Officers Association, because they have a group of African Americans in their department, it's easy for them to call. I, I can walk through a cadet three right. years, get them through field training, right. we have very limited African American um, police officers here, so these larger agencies can just call them half and say, hey, if you come to St. Paul, which is where we love sign up to do, we have 48 other black police officers here. Right. Did that group talk about dynamics at suburban agencies? I help them have that. Quite, quite a bit. Um, the, there was a, a long diatribe, for instance, about how, hey, if you know, speaking as that person, um, hey, if I if I go out and I want to partner with the other black guy, everybody thinks that we're in cahoots somehow. <laughs> like it's like 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 there was social pressure to partner with a white person rather than with the person that they had. You know more familiarity and maybe some friendship with. Um, if if we if we have a conversation, and I'm paraphrasing again, if we have a conversation by the water cooler, you know people are kind of looking like, why are we doing like this? You know. So there were some observations like that that suggested that in an environment where there are too few uh, African Americans, there is increased social pressure on those individuals, um, and that's a challenge that, that that you can overcome by having a positive culture workplace and by having that sort of diversity inclusion training that, that tries to sort of push everybody together and help them all understand each other and get along. <coughs> I will say though, your officers uh, score really, really highly on uh, their own willingness to be inclusive with other officers as they come into the department. And your turnover rate amongst African Americans, uh, if you average it out, is, is pretty low. So um, uh, yes, that social that social dynamic was found. And he called it violent mentality. When you're the one, two, three, four mm -hmm. African American within the department you're on, and actually, I'd say 50% of the African Americans within the folks.
furthest from the top you were considered the islander at one point. Like, well, how do you get past that? And we spoke almost in positive, which is really about this is, again, why the cadet program is one of the strongest assets to pursue. It's getting funding to homegrown individuals together to come up as a team that builds cohesion and kind of an esprit de corps to go into the local park system together as a team and then be integrated and welcomed from the police chief yourself. That's going to keep sustainability and keep attention. Another opportunity to address that is to, is to bring in somebody mid-career, hire for a middle management from outside of the department, and bring in an African American person who can act as a mentor. Um, there's potential in that. We didn't want to go and, and recommend like a hire a black guy, but uh, that, <laughs> because that was also <laughs> <laughs> that was also brought up that if you bring us in, don't make us too close. Technically illegal, but uh, you know, uh, uh, it's it's uh, it, ha having uh, a support network is important. And um, the Black Police Officers Association is a resource. You, if if you encourage those guys to go to the association meetings, then they do get a support network for that. Uh, yes, you. How did you factor when you said twenty four percent? You say African Americans. I'm assuming that. That includes all the African immigrants. Yes. They have historical and attitudinal and cultural differences. Uh, yes. Did you guys factor those differences in terms of uh, considering to join the police? We 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 did collect a lot of data that basically lumps them all in the same group. Uh, in terms of our analytics and pipelines and uh, kind of stuff, there those two groups are all lumped together. When it comes to our diversity paradigm and uh, sort of the, the data that we collected uh, from key informant interviews and focus groups, um, they're regarded as, as two distinct groups. And, and, and if, if I'm trying to get that heterogeneous workforce, if I'm the chief of police in that circumstance, uh, I want to get both. I want to get uh, people that have recent immigration status or you know, second generation immigration status. Uh, people that have been refugees, as well as people who have been, um, uh, who, who are sort of uh, the uh, 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 native uh, African American part of the So um, it's, uh, it's, but, but, but you, you make a good point. In, in our data, those two groups are lumped together. That's correct. But yeah, in the back, and then I'll, I'll come down to my home. The statewide pipeline problem is like more dire than you imagine maybe. Yeah. Um, but I guess I'm wondering in the in your lit review, did you find any evidence for not necessarily recruitment, but trying to reach kids even younger and getting them to think about like is there value in going to high schools, junior yeah. highs? The quote from one of the focus groups was if you're talking to us in high school you're too late. And that was from the police officer association. So come yeah. to us in middle school. Although we found some contradictory information, sure. including people that But uh, 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 yeah, the, the Brooklyn Park Police Department has had some outreach efforts. You got dare officers, you got stuff like that where, where you try to get them younger. Um, we, we didn't really uh, get into that. Great. <coughs> Can you talk about the uh, structural issues that may help change the proportion of African Americans who are omitted from the screening process? For example, Broadway group participates in interviews. Oh, yeah. About interaction. Right. Do that's a past interaction with the police force disqualify someone. You're talking about the funding. Yeah, certainly. Um, well, Mike, that was. So, the barrier analysis that we did kind of deep dive into is where are you losing disproportionately candidates of color? Okay, where does that start? If it's the application. I'm so sorry. Keep going. One, one of the recommendations that was brought up was have a panel, have the oral panel consist of individuals of diverse backgrounds. If this is this is a city government, public safety is part of the city government domain, well then why can't we have a janitor, why can't we have another city government employee sitting in on that panel to be a voting participant because the public safety, the police officer, serves and protects that individual as well. It's not just the police department. However, when we provide more analysis with that, but that's one of the potential recommendations to change and modify that one panel. It shouldn't doesn't have to just be for armed police officers of senior ranks standing and sitting across from that young individual who's trying to apply. Why not have that community voting member was one of the recommendations. Um, also, the, the theory of speed dating was talked about where the police chief would on the front end do the background check and get it first, I'm going to sit down with you in two minutes, three minutes, you're going to just tell me about yourself. So I got an initial assessment of who you are before I see you as a package scripted individual. 
I know that so and so, I've got a good feeling about this individual. Of course, still using the ultimate statewide disqualifiers, those are still in place. But now I've got a good feeling about you as a person, as a candidate. So that also, they said, also eliminated, we found, helped reduce some of the barriers that exist disproportionately. And it helps to modify now by front loading the background process and kind of flipping, as I said, we saw this flipping the application process upside down, putting the chief and imposing his will at each of the each spectrum within there, he's not surprised by anything, or she, if you don't believe she, he's not surprised by anything that he hears because he's already aware of what's about to come. And that also applies with the field train officers, and it goes much more in depth than the paper as well. Like the FTOs briefing the chief daily about problems, looking for an ideology of retain and keep vice a trip removed was often talked about. You know, uh, uh, one, one real specific area that stands out to me was um, with, within the background checks, the, the issue of whether or not a candidate lists all of their addresses correctly. Now, the, your candidates don't have access to LexisNexis, okay? And if you moved around a lot as a kid, you're not gonna remember all of the addresses that uh, that you have. And, um, you know, they specifically, the, the Black Police Officers Association focus group specifically went out of their way to say that this is just killing the people because, um, you know, hey, mom went wherever the rent was cheapest growing up for a long time. And, you know, I remember the place that was by the park and the place that was over here, but I don't, you know, I don't have a list of addresses. And so they, they, they would point to a lot of, like, really Mickey Mouse things that got, that got friends of theirs and anecdotally they were aware of around them that, that, that people were getting failed out of background checks on. Uh, bounce checks, uh, 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 being a witness, that, that was not necessarily uh, involved in the crime. Being in a home that where, where, where police came uh, for a domestic, that kind of stuff. Now, I don't know what you do in a background check. You know, that is outside of the scope uh, that we were able to, to study during the course of, of this uh, project. So, so we didn't deliver a lot of recommendations in that area, but there are a lot of recommendations for you from the focus group in there, if, depending on what you did right. So, yeah. officer we spoke with was skeptical, speaking very broadly, of diversity programs, the black police officers, the white police officers, at least the, the survey police officers. We didn't really speak to white police officers. But with the, the difference was with the black police officers, they were, you know, they, there's nothing that they hated worse than, uh, if you can excuse the uh, expression, a half-assed diversity program that didn't go, that, that, that didn't, that really just stirred things up and then, did, and then didn't have any impact on the culture. And, and that didn't result in any positive changes. Uh, the, in the in the survey, you can see there's there's a general skepticism there, and, and and kind of where my mind went when I was looking at those survey results. This is an active interpretation on my part. But where my mind went is just sort of that 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 uh, that what, what we refer to as a post-racial ideology. That is where um, a person agrees racism is bad, therefore they will not be racist, therefore they will not say anything about race. Or deal with race in any way, you know. <laughs> and that's that's a very popular attitude amongst people that are just kind of done with it, you know. And uh, uh, that's kind of the way I interpreted the survey results. Um, but the, the police officers do back you up on on, on the cultural question. But they also want sustainability too. So the folks group said, yeah, if you're going to change the command climate culture, which I, I wholeheartedly think we both agree that Brooklyn Park is trying to do, because why would they, you know, go through this vulnerable assessment which they're doing? to not try to change culture, or at least consider the dynamics being changed. So now if you do that, the concern for the police department, as far as the, the Black Police Officer Association was, well, what happens when, say, this is Chief's initiative, which he's the chief, everything that happens or fails to happen under his watch is his responsibility, right? That's the chief department. Well, what happens when Chief leaves? What happens when Chief really leaves? 
just outgo this initiative of diversification. And that's what most of them are most fearful of. You know, I can't remember the exact city they quoted and said, all right, five, five lieutenants, so I'm assuming it's one of the major ones, have an American officers, officers, boom, here you go. A new chief comes and goes, I don't want to watch, and demotes them all. Like, we're very fearful of that. Because now you've made us or you've promoted us and we're toothless. Is it the, the term? There are a lot of anecdotes like that in the focus group transfers. It was, like, like I mentioned before, it was very common. So, does that open the door to more research on genuinely uh, diversifying culturally and also addressing the skepticism that you the authors of color are feeling towards diversification? That, you know, that, that is an additional area of research, and I believe you know, it's being lined up as we speak for, for the Park Police Department. Uh, is interested in that, in answering that question, and they, they're working uh, on it. Relating to the question, yeah. we also consider the general four indicators that are reflected in terms of Minnesota uh, diversity issues. Uh, Minnesota is run very low when it comes to uh, general people of color performance yeah. in general. Right. So does that affect in one way or the other um, what you are talking about? Because it seems like um, um, there are non-spoken uh, issues within the bigger larger context, call it cultural or whatever, yeah. that, that has indirect impact on, on outcomes. Um. I can't think of any part of the project that. No, I, th I think what you're what you're referring to is exactly what we tried. We were going to spend a lot of time is what data is missing, and I think we can all assume that there's a significant amount of data missing. We tried to harvest what we could. Could uh, the Brooklyn Park take as many directions? Absolutely. Do you have the resources to do so? Yeah. You know, from a more academic semester, you partner with the RCP, and Truth Brew is already ahead of the curve on looking at that next angle. So I think that's great that they're at least seeing that as something that's a priority. You'd like you said, you can take as many directions. Establish the cultural norms of Minnesota as a state. I think that may be beyond the scope of what RCD is trying to do with students, but specifically we can help, hopefully, from the park, specifically the park and the citizens. And, and certainly, what we're talking about here is access to very highly compensated jobs that would be right in the middle class. Like the park. So, part of the solution, perhaps. Part of the solution. Uh, what else? We're going to sneak out the door now. <laughs> one, one more, and it's, it's, it's a little obscure. We just started hitting on the, the number of uh, African Americans going through the program, the people who the number that they can yeah. post. It just keeps going down as that pipeline gets narrower. Right. But, um, you know, we talked briefly about corrections, about uniform positions and other uniform positions. And anecdotally, I've gone to corrections, and, and the percentage of African Americans in corrections appears to me to be drastically more than law enforcement. If I look at uh, all our partnering agencies, um, they look just like our agency. And, not and I would never there. bring up my employer's diversity data in a situation like this, but I share your opinion on this. <laughs> but yet, you, you, you kind of start in court with me when you talk about corrections, and it almost feels like we have all these correctional facilities around us that has a lot of African Americans sitting there in uniforms doing similar, you know, work yeah. as we do. Absolutely. Um, and you have a reserve officer volunteer program, don't you? We do. <laughs> it almost seems to me that that's a natural, almost yeah. a better place to recruit um, there, maybe into a, a cadet, than it would be in, as to recruit into um, from a school, because they're one-tenth yeah. of one person. For I mean, it's just such a small yeah. number. It's, it's hard to take a full-time correction officer and convince them to take a part-time job. It would be the only barrier there. Um, but you could go to that full-time correctional officer and say, hey, you get through skills. I'd like to see you apply. You know, and uh, or hey, you've already have you already have the education, maybe because a lot of a lot of them go through that law enforcement education process and then go into correction. Why don't you study up for the post exam? Because we you know we'd like to hire. Them. But we don't we don't recommend abandoning the school recruitment strategy because establishing a foothold in the one school could pay off dividends later. What happened when the budget that you, we talked about is working? Yeah. Your budget shrinks. Your cadet program goes to. I mean, I don't even know the current numbers. I know it's single digits, and you want it to be. And you pulled yourself out of the recruitment pipeline into the schools. Yeah. Even if it's just the core and let right. them know Brooklyn Park's interested. And my only thing is, is if you're going to go to Hennepin Tech, um, don't just start with the kids that have already self selected themselves into that PPOB program at Hennepin Tech. Go to the larger group and say, hey, there's this opportunity. We could make you a cadet. You switch programs. 
you're making 20 bucks an hour, and then you have the distinct advantage to hire, to be hired as a police officer who starts at 50 grand a year. What do you think of that? And uh, they'll think good things about that. <laughs> and, we know you lost, and we know you lost one of the kids, or you, you grew to not be a man. There's, you know, there's mechanisms in place. I know they don't have a ton of money, but some kind of recruitment of funds or, or you are obligated to terms of service. We, we pay for this many years of your school, and you're obligated to our service within the department for three years. It's given on for a little bit longer to try. I think it was a one year, 18 months. 18 months. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, that's it's that's a it's it's tough to see that, especially with a hundred person. Absolutely. There's a there's an issue here with this with the size of the department. You know, a fifty thousand person employer can do all kinds of things that that you guys are a little more limited on because because you have a hundred positions. Um, and so I, I can see how losing one individual, whether that be currently employed or in the cadet program, is just like oh, because <laughs> that's a whole percentage point right there. Um, that's just something that you're going to have to take a long view on, I think, and try to average it, average years out with each other, and just continue, continue that barrier analysis, continue a continuous process. Um, I, I, I should say here that we didn't just get this from Metro Transit. No. Uh, we got this the uh, uh, City of Minneapolis. I met with uh, Patience Ferguson. She's the HR director of City of Minneapolis. She told me about this independently. I wasn't, I wasn't interviewing her for this project. I was talking. Uh, I know that my own employer uses a process very similar to this. Um, this is popular. This is what's going on in, in uh, diversification efforts right now. Uh, you, you, you identify which, uh, which uh, application elements or, or other similar things are uh, filtering out candidates of color. You look at that not to say, how can I make this a lower bar? You don't, you don't say that at all. You look at that problem, you look at that element, and you say, how can I make this more directly related to the work the person's doing? You know, so the process grows more fair for all ethnicities, not just, it's not, it's not an act of lowering the bar for one ethnicity, it's an act of, of, of making pro, uh, application elements more specific to the job. So, you know, if, if a written test uh, ends, up, ends up having a disproportionate impact, well, why don't you write a sample police report? I don't really know how to be a police officer, but that's what where my imagination goes with that kind of thing. And then, you know, if if, if practice cannot be adjusted or if it's not a, a barrier, you know, you don't have one. So. What else, Chief? I'm good. You guys did a great job. Thank you.